Welcome. Uh, should we just get started? I don't know if there's supposed to be a grand announcement, but uh, I will, uh, in any case, it wouldn't be very grand about me. My name is Rajesh Chandy. I'm a professor at London Business School. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, I, I, I uh, got, went in and out of the various sessions, and I feel like mine eyes have seen the future. Uh, <coughs> I thought, uh, as an academic, we're not particularly well-known, academics aren't, uh, for insights into the future. We can often say things about what has already happened. Uh, so let me start. Actually, sometimes it is useful to have some historical perspective, especially as we've been talking about where things are today and where things are headed. I thought we might start with a bit of historical perspective that perhaps offers some meaning to what we've heard this morning, and, and no doubt we'll hear, hear about this afternoon, about why uh, the time we live in is a special one. And let me start with a, a question. Um, I, I see a very uh, uh, wise audience here, uh, historically aware. Here's the question. If you can't read it, I'll read it out for you. If you go back about 200 years, 1820, which country was the largest economy in the world in 1820. I have some uh, pointing here. Uh, UK, UK, the British Empire, yeah. Any, any other ideas? The largest economy in the world in 1820. India, India, India China, Holland. Holland uh, yeah. Okay, <coughs> well, those of you who are thinking Western Europe, combine every country in Western Europe and it would be that dark blue line. And that, that peak there uh, in the purple colored line is 1820, and that's China. In 1820, China was responsible for one third of the world economy, 1820. Right? In fact, the history of humankind has been one of economic dominance by China. The last 200 years have just been uh, an aberration <laughs> relative to that pattern. Now, it wasn't just China. If you look at, uh, if I complicate that uh, graph a bit more, you see that light blue line um, that comes up out, of, out from nowhere, oh, out here, <coughs> from nowhere, that's the United States, uh, from nowhere to becoming one quarter of the world economy uh, post World War II. Um, Europe coming out of nowhere, seemingly going up, that's the red line there. Uh, you can see India seems to be a long period of relative decline uh, starting in the 1400s. Uh, India was still about a third of the world economy. So <clears throat> when we say emerging markets and change in emerging markets, actually this is a pattern of change that's gone in many directions over time. Now, a most recent manifestation of this change is in all of the development, for example, that's happening in China, the very impressive developments happening in China, for good as well as for bad. That is the famous picture uh, in Beijing, uh, uh, from a high rise in Beijing. Uh, uh, we recognize that as well. Of course, once again, this is nothing new. When the United Kingdom went from a small, marginal, rural, agrarian economy to becoming an empire that ruled the world based on its uh, industrial uh, might uh, and an urban economy, that too was based on another period of transformative growth, another generation of transformative growth. I have a question for you. If you think of the height of that period of transformative growth, roughly 1820 when we left China uh, to, say, 1870, roughly the Victorian era, what do you think was the average annual growth rate in the United Kingdom that took the UK GDP from being a, a tiny one to becoming you know, one that led to the uh, British Empire? What do you think was the average growth rate in the UK between 1820 and 1870? 10%. 10%, sort of China level growth, thank you. 3%. 3 to 4%. 1.3%. Ladies and gentlemen, the wealth you see around you here, as well as in much of the world, much of the developed world, is a result of the power of compounding. Year after year after year of roughly 1.3% uh, growth. 
Now, I didn't just pick a particular point in British history to make this point. Uh, that middle highlighted row is uh, 1820 to 1870 in the United Kingdom. You can see that was a dramatic jump relative to what existed before, 0.3% uh, before. The same story with the United States. The same story with Japan, uh, an economy that seemingly created the Asian, uh, Asian miracle. The Japanese growth rate between, uh, during that period, 1913 to 1960, was about 2%. So relative to that, if you look at this map, and let me uh, decode this map for you. <clears throat> this is a map of the world economy colored by GDP growth last year. If you look at that map, the, the dark blue is more than 10% growth, plus 10% growth. Red is negative growth. You can see a pattern of growth evolving, and this is not just one year's growth, right? Uh, that is, again, unprecedented in human history. The world has never seen, not just in its scale, but in its size, the level of growth that we're witnessing today. Now, <clears throat> we've talked about um, Asia, we've talked about Europe. You know the exciting story, when, we, when I, uh, my MBAs uh, think about where they're going to head, uh, the exciting story seems to be these days about Africa. In fact, I'll talk a fair bit about Africa in the next few minutes. Uh, <clears throat> and so lately, uh, there's been a b bunch of good press about Africa, because it's worth remembering, just in 2000, that was an economist cover, the hopeless continent. Last year, The Economist had a different cover. <coughs> a hopeful continent. Uh, <coughs> now, you may remember Bob Geldof. Well, of course we know Bob Geldof, Sir Bob Geldof, uh, and Live Aid. Uh, this is what uh, Sir Bob Geldof had to say at a recent uh, um, uh, event for financiers. <coughs> My name is Bob. I'm a PE, private equity, I'm a PE whore, and I'm looking for 20 million pounds to invest in Africa. And the, uh, and the, the conference was called the Super Return International Conference, so apparently people are looking for uh, returns. So again, as we look at the world moving forward, actually Europe is meant to grow at 2% uh, or so uh, next year. 2% growth would be growth that our Victorian forebears would have loved to have. And yet, somehow 2% seems measly relative to what we seem to be used to these days. <clears throat> and that's partly because of the scale and the intensity of that growth. What took the United Kingdom 154 years to achieve, that's how long it took for the United Kingdom to double its GDP during its last period of growth. It took 100, it's from the 1700s to the late 18, uh, mid-1800s, 154 years. Korea achieved in 10 years that same level of GDP growth doubling. China achieved in 12 years, India achieved in 15 years, and at the rate that Africa, um, some economies are going, if the comp power of compounding continues to work in that direction, uh, and that is an if, um, then that could be even faster. <clears throat> I have a question for you. What predicts, what explains rather, this pattern of unprecedented growth? We truly are in a special era, but what makes it special? What explains this? Your thoughts? The internet? Uh, true, uh, the internet probably had a role, yeah. So connection, kind of communications more broadly. Sorry? Communications more broadly, whether it's mobile or uh, anything else, yeah, of that type. What else? Sorry? Global flows. Global flows of trade, of ideas, of people. Yeah? Sorry? Shipping, yes, absolutely. And, and innovations in shipping, for example. Oil, yeah, energy more generally, yeah. Debt, uh, yeah, that's a, uh, uh, Gita, that's an interesting point of view, which might imply uh, maybe good or bad, yeah. <clears throat> well, um, of course, speaking of the internet, I'll read this out. This is a newborn. Uh, I'm sorry, the name Adam has already been taken. How about Adam 99387? Uh, <clears throat> uh, we've seen that, uh, we've seen that uh, before. So I, uh, uh, 
a couple of weeks ago, I went to the website Alexa. Alexa collects website uh, uh, traffic data from around the world uh, on a regular basis. If you go to Alexa and look at the top websites around the world, it's actually instructive reading. Um, so if you go to uh, Alexa and look at the number one website in the United States, what do you think it is? Number one most accessed website in the United States? Google, yeah. The UK? Uh, Facebook is number two. Yeah, close enough, yeah. Uh, UK, Google. Uh, let's go to a very different culture, shall we say. France, what do you think is the number one? Google. Number two? Let me show you. <coughs> Uh, again, I apologize you can't read this. I'll, I'll read it. Uh, it's a shame. Uh, <coughs> ah, technology. Uh, but uh, <coughs> that's uh, the first row there is Google. And I'm, I'm, uh, the columns are UK, U, uh, US, UK, France, Germany, Italy, Spain, Israel. Across the board, it's Google. Number two, across the board, is Facebook. Number three, across the board, it's YouTube. Across all of those countries. Number four, now this varies, uh, in the US it's uh, Yahoo, uh, in others it varies, and Wikipedia. Now, <clears throat> what if we, were, if we were to look at the same statistics? Most accessed websites in the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, in the Middle East and North Africa? What do you think? Number one in the Middle East and North Africa. Two? Al Jazeera. Well, it turns out to be virtually identical. It's Google, it's Facebook, it's YouTube. Again, Wikipedia, it varies. Uh, Yahoo, it varies. It's virtually identical. Go to Sub-Saharan Africa. Virtually identical. Google. In Mauritania, you may have heard of the violence in Mauritania, one of the poorest countries on earth, the desert. Number, number one turns out to be Facebook. <clears throat> Actually, I, I forgot to. If you look here, Syria is going through uh, a civil war. Number one website accessed from Syria, Facebook. It's actually interesting reading to look at the rankings in Syria. A fair number of porn sites, much more than others. I, I won't get into why. <coughs> uh, <coughs> what is it? Speaking of Alibaba, the big exception is China. The uh, big exception is China, uh, where Google is number 16. The others are not even in the top 50. Russia is an exception. Um, uh, Google is number three, uh, but the others are fairly, there are other Russian websites. So Beyond, yeah, well, exactly, exactly. <clears throat> uh, or you, uh, some of these don't even appear in China. <clears throat> so the big exception, otherwise, besides these two economies, to some extent, Iran, which I didn't get into, the world? seems to access the same places when it goes online. Now, we can think about the implications of that. It could be that uh, um, we're all going to the same uh, chicken videos, possibly. Uh, odds are we're, going, we're doing different things, but the platforms are the same. Uh, we're doing different things because the customer needs turn out to be intensely different. So uh, this morning, I went to the Twitter feed for transport for London. You know, uh, we, we heard about the importance of understanding customer needs. So here seems to be, this seems to be the kinds of customer needs. We're improving customer service by making it easier to get a refund. Uh, escalator work at Paddington Station, et cetera. Yeah, uh, that's, that's TFL. <clears throat> what if you go to the same kind of Twitter feed for Lagos, Nigeria? I have to tell you. It's the most entertaining thing you could do. <clears throat> Here's what, oh, I can't, oh, shoot, you can't read this. There's a bus burning seriously. Uh, uh, <clears throat> everywhere under flames, uh, you know. Uh, et cetera. And then time spent in traffic, 18 minutes. This is at 5.55. There, there are hours often spent in traffic. I love it. Four guys just robbed a bike. Uh, it's like someone's tweeting <laughs> as he's driving. Those guys just robbed a bike. You can imagine, you know, knowledge of a gigantic fire is actually quite useful to have. <laughs> and so you can imagine the intensity of need associated uh, with being on Twitter <laughs> in Nigeria. Far more exciting, or important, arguably, <laughs> than, say, with TFL. <clears throat> 
Ushahidi, you've probably heard of, um, was a mashup sort of uh, website created uh, at the, uh, after, well, during the Kenyan elections of 2008, I guess. Um, when there were, uh, there, were, there were instances, large instances of uh, violence, rapes, and this and that. And so this group of young tech entrepreneurs in, uh, in uh, Nairobi, Kenya, came up with a mapping software where you could text uh, your location and uh, the type of incident. Again, it's a shame you can't see it, but uh, it's, you know, a house burned down at this location or, you know, murder, et cetera, et cetera. And they map it. So you don't have to rely on official government statistics or, or uh, figures. You know where to go and where not to go, where, what, where um, your relatives might be and how their uh, situation is based on the power of the crowd. And that's a famous Kenyan story, a few years old now, that's since been used uh, to look at oil spills. The stat platform, Ushahidi, a Kenya developed platform, is being used for oil spills in the Gulf of, uh, in, the, uh, in the US, uh, um, uh, Gulf of Mexico, uh, Japanese earthquake. So people would send in through their mobiles information about how they had been affected in the earthquake. And you can see the hotspots uh, on the east coast of Japan based on a Kenyan platform. <clears throat> Some of you mentioned trade. Absolutely trade has been different. Of course, the British Empire was built on trade. Trade is not a new concept to humankind. But the pattern of trade we're seeing now, or the pattern of increase in trade that we're seeing, we're seeing now, is once again unprecedented in human history. And this is not just a linear increase. This is as close to a hockey stick as it gets. That's total exports as a, as a percentage of world GDP. This is Foreign direct investment, some of you have invested, no doubt, uh, in emerging markets, for example. Foreign direct investment as a percentage of GDP, as close to a hockey stick as it gets. It's not just a simple da -da -da kind of linear uh, growth. This is a dramatic shift. So to the extent our worldviews uh, about the world were created here in the 90s, or even here, in the 2000s, our worldviews arguably are obsolete or dangerous because we fail to comprehend just how different things are. The <coughs> many of you pointed out all of the reasons, but as, uh, as since many of you are managers, you, you do not give enough credit to yourselves. I would argue that a good, re a good part of the reason why the world is growing at the rate it is growing now is because of management. Uh, <clears throat> and let me explain uh, why. So although technology and although trade uh, are crucial, I would argue that for us to harness the winds of technology and trade, we need management. And for that, I want to take you to my home state in India. Uh, it's a, st a state on the west coast of India called Kerala. And Kerala has the distinct, proud distinction, useful now that uh, now while the World Cup is on, you know, football is the biggest sport in the world. Well, the, big, the biggest team sport in the world, as defined by the size of the teams, is snake boat racing. <laughs> 120, up to 120 people on these boats rowing away, so that's what it looks like. Yeah? Uh, and there are some leaders, there are people who chant, this is a typical Indian style, uh, <clears throat> and you go really fast in these snake boats. They're meant to be military boats way back. But of course, you know, the Phoenicians and the Arabs and others, long ago, the Hawaiians, uh, uh, long ago, uh, realized uh, that uh, you don't really need 120 people doing their thing. In fact, all you have to do is detect the wind, harness the wind, and build ways in which that will allow you to go forward. So as we think about the winds of technology, the winds of trade that are happening here today, we owe it to ourselves to be able to detect that's better than others so we can go faster. Design and build and improve the ships better than others so we can go faster, perhaps. Or, and once you've created the ships, do more with them. Now, 
My favorite story, and this is a familiar story, uh, of this detection, deployment, um, and the winds more generally, uh, is, about, is uh, that of an alum from London Business School, Nick Hughes. Uh, Nick Hughes' story is a famous one, partly because Nick Hughes helped create uh, the M-Pesa mobile money service. You're all familiar with the M-Pesa mobile money service uh, in, uh, in Kenya. So just uh, those of you who are not familiar, this is a person-to-person, uh, -person, basically, texting, money texting service in Kenya. Most recent numbers suggest that over 40% of Kenya's GDP goes through one service by one phone company, M-Pesa. There are more, uh, there are more M active M-Pesa users, well, uh, uh, there are more active M-Pesa accounts than there are economically active Kenyans. Practically everyone in Kenya uses M-Pesa. This was just released uh, a few years ago. And this came out of the efforts of, uh, uh, collaborative efforts of a multinational, a local uh, telecom subsidiary, and literally tens of millions of Kenyans. The interesting story about M-Pesa, and, and if you're interested, I've written a case about it, and we covered this in the MBA program uh, at the school. But <clears throat> what I wanted to highlight was, even though the winds were clearly in play in Kenya at that time. It wasn't so obvious if you sat in Newbury uh, at Vodafone headquarters. When Nick initially made the pitch to, for the M-Pesa mobile money service, the response was, <clears throat> well, Kenya, really? 70% uh, of our sales are from Europe. Yeah, we could use our growth in Europe. Why Kenya? Nick's original intent was to do, to do good with mobile money, because at the time, 70% roughly of Kenyans didn't have bank accounts. Uh, they did have mobile phones. Uh, and the, often the response was, wow, you really want to do CSR? Why not just write a big check, you know, those blow up kinds of checks? Uh, <clears throat> we're a mobile phone company. Banking? I mean, it's hard enough to deal with uh, with uh, the telecoms regulators. Do we really need to deal with uh, bank regulators? Uh, <clears throat> or as uh, some have pointed out, uh, 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 vote, uh, uh, well, not, well, more generally, uh, in telecoms, um, the uh, progression goes from 1G to 2G to 3G, 4G. And when Nick proposed this, they said, no G, this is really that simple, <laughs> and that's what you want to do? So initially, at least, um, uh, the response to the M-Pesa proposition was no. There were winds blowing in Kenya, but it was hard to feel if you lived here. But to Vodafone's credit, they turned around, and to Diffid's credit, there's a long story about how it came about. But the point I wanted to um, emphasize here is that the M-Pesa story also illustrates the story of the blind men and the elephant. Each of us sees one part of the elephant. And which part we see is a function of what, what we can feel. So if we feel, uh, if we feel the, uh, the tusk, well, that feels like a spear. If we feel the ears, that feels like a fan or a wall or a trunk or, or something else. The M-Pesa phenomenon represents also the many faces of innovation. You know, when the bankers saw this remarkable innovation that the Kenyans eventually turned out to absolutely love, when the bankers in Kenya first saw this, what do you think what their response was? You think they said, well, this is an interesting idea. It's in financial services. We're in financial services. We should be innovating. We heard about how banks should be innovating. Was that the response? No. The response was, kill it, literally. Bankers in Kenya got around and tried to kill M-Pesa because they felt it was a, an unsecure, potentially dangerous, and in any case, cheap and not very useful um, uh, product. <clears throat> because they only saw one part uh, of this product. And that was, indeed, it was cheap. It was not as secure. It was insecure enough, it turned out, et cetera. This process involved, uh, pro innovation involved. But the best part of the M-Pesa story is actually what Nick Hughes is up to now. Nick has, uh, is now an entrepreneur on his own. 
And he's developed a service called mCOPA. mCOPA is mobile-based lighting. Some background. Most Kenyans use kerosene. About 60% of Kenyans, indeed East Africans, use kerosene for light. Now, kerosene is bad quality light. Um, children's eyesight suffers. More importantly, they inhale, quite literally, they inhale smoke every day. And death by indoor smoke inhalation is one of the largest causes of death worldwide. <coughs> it's also a danger, uh, or a creates a danger of fire. Uh, all sorts of uh, problems. From a Kenyan's point of view, importantly, it costs about 40 cents per day to use kerosene. Now, 40 cents a day, if you're earning $2 a day, is a lot of money. Kenya, uh, uh, Nick Hughes has an idea. He says, well, Kenya's got plenty of uh, sunshine. I will develop, he has developed, a solar lighting system that um, is mobile enabled, M-PESA enabled. His logic is, you know, now that we have an M a mobile money platform in emerging markets, we should be able to do a lot more with that platform. Just as the online, the internet platform created possibilities for giant behemoths, some of the, some of the uh, largest corporations, or at least the most highly capitalized corporations on earth, rely on this, the internet uh, platform. His argument is, similarly, the mobile money platform can offer opportunities for innovation for entrepreneurship. So here's how it works. If you're a Kenyan, um, you go to an MCOPA dealer. It's called MCOPA. Now, the device itself costs about $200. But you put down $40, you can take this home. Every time you switch on the lamp, the lamp automatically deducts about 40 cents from your M-Pesa account. Now, if you continue to use the lamp on a regular basis for a year, the lamp is yours. That means you have free electricity or free lighting for the duration of the lamp. It comes with a two-year warranty. Now, this is because the MCOPA lamp <coughs> has a SIM card embedded in it. So essentially, when you switch on the lamp, the lamp texts Nick's servers that are based here, actually, in the UK, and says, deduct. 40 cents from this person's account. Now, the cool thing is, he's able to use, potentially, the information he has on the payment patterns and usage patterns of his customers. At this point, there are over 60,000 of them. Um, he can use that to offer loans to them. Why? Because he knows their payment patterns. He knows when they get paid, essentially, is when they top up, for example. He has collateral that they value. If you do not pay your loan, your light gets switched off. And Nick says, you know, this is not that sim uh, dissimilar from the uh, electricity service we had growing up. He grew up here in England. And he says, we had to put coin into uh, a, a device and turn a dial, and that's how we got electricity. Pay as you go electricity. In some ways, we're back to the future. <coughs> so. What, what we're seeing here is just as, yeah, but, but in a far more intense way, essentially in a, uh, entrepreneurship and innovation in emerging markets is entrepreneurship and innovation on steroids. In a, in a far more intense way, you're seeing the many faces of innovation, product innovation, process, platform, business model innovation. And as all of this is happening, it's worth recognizing that these may happen outside the boundaries that we have in our own minds. As we become successful in our own lives, we develop necessarily boundaries in our minds. I'm a mobile phone company. I'm a bank. Well, if you cross boundaries, that seems uncomfortable. I am a Europe-based mobile phone company or a bank. We do mobile technology. 
combining these or going across these boundaries becomes hard over time because that's where our successes lie. But I would argue that the greatest opportunities for innovation or what some of us have called concept arbitrage, taking ideas from one place and applying them another, exist across boundaries. They exist across industry boundaries, across technology boundaries, and certainly across geographic boundaries. And so <clears throat> if I had to summarize, what we have in emerging markets across our boundaries are intense needs. You know, a lot of uh, exciting work around green tech is happening in China. Why? It's not the same thing to think about the environment if you're here and breathing London reasonably clean air versus when you're in Beijing breathing that air. There is a visceral level of understanding of <coughs> needs that exists if you're immersed in those contexts. It's not the same thing if you have eight bank accounts um, to say, well, should we do mobile banking or not? Or do consumers care? Well, if you do not have a bank, if you never had any formal financial services, it's a whole different level of intensity of need. And similarly, if you do not have light, uh, and, and the kind of light you have is literally killing you, it's a very different intensity of need. That intensity of need, combined with the possibilities we talked about, trade, technology, and indeed better management, can, can yield uh, unprecedented growth. So as we look to 2014, actually the world looks rather promising that uh, the, the light green there is 0 to 3% growth. Europe is at 2% is what they expect. Much of the world actually is growing, actually growing at rates that are higher than the Victorian era. And so <clears throat> as we think about our own future, it's worth sort of noting a few things. <clears throat> First, about boundaries in the mind. How do we define what we do? How flexible are our boundaries? How able are we to cross boundaries? Do we do things to consciously cross boundaries? The world is converging not just in technology, geography, economies, everything is converging. That requires us to know not just what our competitors are doing or what our existing customers are doing, but to look across boundaries. And so that requires us to build peripheral vision. You know, people uh, who have studied really good basketball players point out that uh, really good basketball players have this weird ability to actually see behind their heads. And, and when you've, people have interviewed these uh, uh, basketball players who could seemingly see behind their heads, they say, how can you see this? And they say, you know, throughout my life, I've been exercising my eye muscles so that I can see farther on the sides. How well do we exercise our peripheral vision? Not just what we're doing today, but what's happening on the sides. <clears throat> Where do we look for inspiration? There are, there are literally a millions of points of light happening. And then they're not just in the familiar places. There are new paths to profits being created. The reason Nick Hughes has a very different business model than any other lighting provider is because he could create things from scratch. And so entirely new business models are being created, especially in emerging markets. So will we discover new models? And the important point I wanted to end with is, in many ways, the future is already here. Uh, the famous quote uh, goes, the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. Some of us are experiencing the future before others. So <clears throat> the future is already here. The question is, will we notice? And indeed, can we do what it takes to catch the winds? <coughs> so <clears throat> let me end uh, with a very short video. Um, the, I, I hosted a panel at the LBS Africa Day event uh, a couple of months ago. And one of my panelists, panelists was the head of um, IBM Research Africa. And I asked each of the panelists 
Can you give me a, one inspiring story of innovation in, based on what you have seen? And this was the story that uh, my panelist uh, from IBM Africa uh, had to share. Uh, let me <coughs> play that. It may look like something from a low-budget sci-fi movie, but this eight-foot robot in the heart of Kinshasa helps bring real-life order to real-life chaos. Introduced in June last year to regulate the traffic, it's proving surprisingly effective and popular. And now its creators, an association called Women Technology, have global ambitions. There are many robots in the world, but a robot which is doing road safety and traffic control, that's truly made in Congo. We must sell our expertise to other countries, as well as Central Africa, why not the US, Europe and Asia? Each robot costs about 15,000 US dollars. The machines are powered by solar panels, made of aluminium to withstand the equatorial climate, and equipped with cameras. When the robot captures images, they're sent over the internet to a center where they're stored, and could be used to prosecute people who've committed offenses. The pictures could in future be sent on to the police, cutting accidents while gaining revenue for the state. Drivers seem to be getting the message. The robot is good. When it stops the traffic, you can see that everybody stops, and the pedestrians can cross without a problem. Thank God for those who invented it. The traffic police bother us too much. Let's leave robots to do the job. In this frenetic megacity of 10 million, the people seem happy to let the robots take control. Thank you very much. <clears throat> A few minutes for questions two, or, two. or comments or discussion. Not all at the same time. Yes, please. Yes, thank you. <coughs> oh, sorry. Mike, please. So do you think this uh, level of growth is sustainable, or are we in a, yeah. a long-term bubble? It's a, it's a good question. My guess is as good as yours. Uh, but and that's why it's worth looking at what the causes are. Right? Um, we've talked about some of the causes. Well, those seem sustainable. Gita pointed out. Some of the other causes potentially is this debt, is this uh, uh, premature euphoria. Whatever the cause is, the fact is, at least right now, in a lot of places where hope didn't seem to exist, there is hope. Um, and so the question is, you know, your guess is as good as mine. I personally am optimistic because uh, Precisely of the reasons we talked about. It's not just the fact that technology is happening at unprecedented rate, trade is happening. It's also policy and governance is changing, partly because information is so available. So as an example, people used to say, well, the challenge in, um, say, Africa or uh, parts of the developed world uh, is one of government and governance. The elections in Kenya um, last time, not the previous one where Ushahidi was formed last time, were relatively, by, by many standards, trouble free. Now, one of the things that Ushahidi did was to text and create a map of electoral irregularities. So if I'm uh, the opposition uh, party, I can, uh, I can rely on the crowd throughout Kenya to figure out where there are reports of irregularities. People in Kenya look at what's happening in Rwanda and say, dang, if those guys can grow, then I should be able to as well. Look at, they look at you, uh, uh, Ethiopia, and they're all far more connected than they ever were. So I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic also because of the value of transparency. But again, my guess, guess is as good as yours. Yes. Uh, hi. So, so I just want to ask about uh, uh, you know sort of 
implementing business models that currently exist in the West uh, in the developing countries. Mm. Uh, you've, as in the examples you've given were more or less uh, social enterprises, so you know they had to innovate in a way which which was sort of unique to those countries. But if, if you are trying to build, say, an Amazon of uh, China or, or Nigeria, do you think it would be uh, similar or you know, how, how, how different would it be you know, to do those things in the developing economies? Yeah, so um, one of our alums, uh, Savio Kwan, uh, uh, was uh, a, uh, one of the earliest people at, uh, at, uh, at Alibaba, some of you mentioned Alibaba uh, in China. And Alibaba is, like, is going to be listed. The estimates are 150 billion in market cap is what they're expecting, uh, all in the space of a very short period of time. Now, Savio's background was in General Electric. The, uh, the founder was an English teacher who says, I don't know a whole lot about the internet. Um, if you ask Savio, however, he'll say, the way Alibaba grew was a uniquely Chinese story. It's about Chinese mythology becoming part of uh, uh, the culture there. It's about them being able to recognize the true potential of the Chinese market relative to, say, eBay or some of their Western competitors. So absolutely, there are unique aspects to emerging markets. But you know, I tend to think that the difference between social and uh, non-social often blurs in, in developing countries. So uh, the principles of innovation and principles of change, I suspect, are quite similar. That would be my uh, speculation. If you ask Nick Hughes uh, about what he's doing, he's very much an unashamed, unashamedly profit-oriented entrepreneur. And he says that's the only way to uh, do good as well, if we wanted to do good. So uh, of course, there are differences, uh, and there are unique aspects to the uh, economies, but the trends exist. And therefore, again, it's useful to look across boundaries and immerse ourselves in the local context before we try to transfer. A simple copy and place job probably won't work. Yes? Um, Rajesh, you had a chart that showed um, FDI as a percentage of uh, GDP. Now, I don't know if sort of what GDP that was. Was that GDP of the world as a whole? or world as a whole. So if, if I sort of take that into account, I sort of think it's going to be more capital going from the developed countries to the emerging countries. And the petroleum probably producing countries going to the other part of the world. Right. Would this not mean basically that in a couple of years' time, a lot of the people in the developed countries will be working for other sort of people outside their own country? <laughs> and creating an un, sort of imbalance that is not sustainable? It's an interesting question. I, I suspect, uh, again, there are experts here, I, uh, and please feel free to jump in. Uh, I suspect we're some ways off from that world. Uh, and I'm not entirely sure it's a one-way world. Um, the, sorry? The development, the money FDI is pouring out of China is not sustainable. Yeah. Yeah, and so your argument is it's both ways then? Or is yeah. it largely the other way? Well, I always wanted to try to investment figure that the American way. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're buying up you know, half of New York, as well as half of London, they're buying up half of Sydney, I can tell you that. Yeah, yeah. so, so it, it, it's both ways. Now, to your point, uh, also more in a more abstract way, there's a sense of worry in many developed markets about what all of this means, given these relative uh, flows. In fact, the fact that this is a relatively novel thing is partly a worry as well, or we don't know how to comprehend that. But once again, I would say, if Europe grows at 2%, you know, we can see, look around us, we see the wealth that was created at 1.3% growth. There's a lot more prosperity to be had across the world. Now, if we can tap the patterns of trade and technology that exist across, that, no reason why that can't be even higher. Now, just relating it back to the earlier point, that's where your ethos, your mindset makes a difference. The, uh, when you ask people at Alibaba, why is it that Alibaba has had a hard time expanding outside? So the Chinese are uh, investing. Ch Alibaba wants to clone its successful model outside. And they've had a hard time, partly because they're a very Chinese company. 
And the reason we have every week or two, we have large delegations of Chinese CEOs come through campus at LBS is because they have a keen interest not only in spending money here, but also in that pattern of trade of ideas uh, as well. I should probably have overstayed my welcome. We have lunch uh, available here. Is there a last, oops, no, is there a slide that's supposed to describe, is there anyone here who can describe what we're meant to do next? <laughs> to go to lunch. Okay, lunch I believe is that way, so thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat>